At Les Schwab Tires, we're drivers just like you. We merge, we get stuck in traffic, we go on road trips, and we know what it means to truly rely on your car, which is why we do everything we can to make things right with you and your vehicle. From checking your brakes for free to patching up a flat when you need it. So if that sounds good to you, well, we're right there with you. Les Schwab Tires. Doing the right thing matters. Log Talk Radio. future that lies ahead, one that will be here sooner than you think, and one that you have an important role to play in bringing about. At The World Transformed, we want to introduce you to what may be the greatest transformation of them all, the one that begins with considering and acting on the almost limitless possibilities that lie before us, and that ends somewhere beyond the reach of the human imagination. So, when does this amazing future begin? Well, today is the day. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-blogger, co-futurist, and co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Doing great on a cold evening. Um, I understand it's even colder where you're at. Well, I hear that, uh, you know, it's cold even down in Florida, somebody was telling me today. So what's it What's it like down there in uh, Louisiana right now? You guys getting snow? Uh, you getting... Uh... No, no, no precipitation, but uh, it's uh, the temperature is definitely dropping off. Uh, uh, supposedly, there is a chance uh, of a freeze tonight, um, which, which oh. is a little unusual. This, you know, at this point in November, uh, for you know this part of the world, but um, it's uh, it's a lot more than freezing already where you're at. I understand you. Well, yeah, but we that, got down uh, below zero. Uh, using the Fahrenheit scale for those who are more Celsius oriented. And uh it was uh really cold. I mean we get we get weather like this once in a while in Colorado. It's not it's not real frequent, but we get it to, we get it once in a while. But usually January, February. Usually not November. Yeah. yeah. Um very, and, and and we had this kind of summer thing going on until then. Because it was very rare that we got this far in the year. Got to November. This is actually our first actual snow down here at the, out of the mountains. And uh yeah. It's like we went we went from late summer to the dead of winter. In, uh, <laughs> overnight, <order>. overnight. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty pretty much. So, uh, so some some odd seasonal stuff going on there, but uh, but an exciting week, I think. A lot going on for us uh, for us to talk about. And uh, you know, I called the show "Modern Problems." I was really trying to find a way to make it into. Uh, uh, make it into first world problems or, or one of those uh, uh, <laughs> one, one of those jokes, but uh, truly before before we get to the uh, before we get to the problem part of it, uh, a big celebration in space this week. It's rare that we do a space theme show two weeks in a row. In fact, I can't think of the last time we did that. And uh, speaking of first, we're doing a forty five minute show this evening, so it's the first time we've ever done one of those. So uh, just just a, just an odd kind of a week uh, all the way around, but. Um, Let's talk about what's great about what happened this week with the uh, Rosetta mission to the uh, Comet uh, 67P. Well, I mean, uh, they, this um, this spacecraft, Rosetta, has been, you know, uh, um, basically uh, uh, on a mission to rendezvous for almost 10 years with this comet, right? Um, Absolutely, it was, yeah. It was Launched in 2004, uh, used you know used the gravity of Mars to kind of speed itself up to the right speed, and then it kind of got in parallel with the comet, and uh, uh, it, the spacecraft woke up when it needed to, and uh, you know the lander separated properly, and and it did touch down, and then it touched down again, and then it touched down a third time. Um, right. 
Uh, it's actually uh, fillet is the uh, uh, the lander, right? The probe that was exactly. launched from Rosa. And yeah. yeah. That's right, and uh, unfortunately, the harpoon system uh, did not um, uh, did not uh, it apparently didn't even deploy. Uh, it, it just didn't it didn't work properly to uh, to lash itself to the comet or to you know to shoot a uh, an, uh, like a uh, an arrow or whatever into the comet. That that system didn't work, and so it. it but now it's at rest, uh, and uh, the where it is 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 a bit unfortunate, although. Um, you know, a lot of good science can happen where it is. It's just that it's not the, quite the ideal spot that they were that they had, uh, were hoping to hit. Well, they did hit, and then it just kept skipping along the surface there until it got into a slightly uh, worse spot. And um, you know, and and that has a lot to do with the power issue, doesn't it, Phil? Yeah, yeah, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, I just want to touch on a few of the things you said. One of which is, wow, ten years. You know, they launched it 10 years yeah. ago. This is such an audacious and far-reaching uh, mission that uh, the European Space Agency uh, created. And it just my hat is off to the imagination of the engineers who came up with this idea. Um, yeah, we're going to get to this comet. we got to get up to 40,000 miles per hour. Um, we got to launch way early. Because we don't have, you know, we're, we're not going to save up and build a rocket that will that will speed something up that fast. So we're going to play a little gravitational billiards out here in the solar system and get the speed we need so that we can uh, we can catch up with this comet and go into orbit around it and and launch a, uh, a lander on it. We you know we talked a couple of weeks ago about um uh, th- this kind of space on the cheap stuff that's happening with India and with with other players coming into uh coming into space exploration and um this isn't necessarily space on the cheap. The European Space Agency put a lot of money into this, um, and, and right. you know, had cooperation from NASA. And I mean, this this is a big project, but it was an elegant way of achieving something that they probably weren't going to be able to build a rocket for and do otherwise. And it's just brilliant um, that it worked. You know, I mean, to, to wait ten years, the you know, if the moment finally comes, you're you're hovering over the comet, and yes, we touch down on the comet, and then. Uh, the harpoon thing doesn't work. And I, I guess it's too early to say exactly why that didn't work out. Um, but I wonder if one of the reasons might be just that the composition of the comet is somewhat different than than we thought. You know, I mean, one of, one of the things about landing on the comet is to find out what these things are really all about. We've had all kinds of supposition and speculation. We think we've got a pretty good idea about what comets are like, but we've never really touched one before. And you know, I wonder if uh, if if it was designed I, I, with one set of suppositions, and those just turned out not to be the case. Well, I think that the uh, the issue is that the uh, harpoon didn't fire, and so oh, they didn't fire know, at all. Oh. Didn't fire at all, and so oh. um, you know, yeah, it, it'd be one thing if it fired, and you know, it just it was you know, it turns out that comets are just loose gravel, and there was nothing to catch, um, right? Or if it fired and it was so hard it just pinged off of it like it's a giant diamond or something um right it, it was it, apparently it was neither one of those things it it just didn't fire and so you know when it touched down with almost no gravity at all on a on a comet it just started you know just, it kind of it uh just kind of bounced and then uh hit, hit again and then bounced a, a second time apparently it's at rest but unsecured on the surface and yeah. so well, what I've read um, is know, that uh, two of, two of the legs are down, and one leg is apparently standing up, not touching the ground. I mean, the, you know, it's it's hard to get yeah. a picture of exactly how this thing is uh, how this thing is sitting here, but it's it's apparently fairly precarious. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, still taking pictures, is still able to uh, to send back a lot of telemetry and do and do some of the work that uh, that it was that it was designed to do. But I but I think uh, you, you touched on the other big. Uh, factor in the story here, and, and of course we, we caught it in the name of our show here too, which is the battery life. Um, the thing had about 60 hours of battery life prior to recharge, and of course the idea was you land this uh, thing on the sunny side of the comet, and you get 12 hours of sun every day, and you just keep recharging that battery, and you've got a nice long shelf life for this for this probe and a nice long shelf life for the mission. Ten years to get there, and who knows how long running off solar power uh, we could we could keep this uh, 
uh, keep this probe going. But sadly, that's not apparently not to be the case because of the unfortunate nature of the bounce that it took, uh, the second bounce, I guess, that it took when it hit. It looks like it's apparently lodged at the rim of a crater or right under the rim of a crater. Anyway, it's not getting that 12 hours of sun. It's getting about, what, one and a half hours of sun um, out, of, out of the 12. So, so the, you know, the, what that means is that it, it, they'll still be able to do science with it. and um, yeah. But it It'll be much more intermittent. They'll have to, you know, uh, you know, it might be that, you know, you get you get 30 minutes of power once a week, kind of thing, to do do some science with, it, it, you know, it, instead of in, instead of working with it all the time. So uh, that's a little bit disappointing. Uh, but um, you know what? Hey, um, there's so much we don't know that, uh, that you know, uh, textbooks will be rewritten. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I feel confident, you know, uh, just based on uh, what, what what this thing will learn. And so it, it's uh, um, it's exciting, very, very exciting. And hats off to these folks. It's a great it's a great story. I'm really looking forward to anything they can tell us about comets because they are still, even in this day and age, a little bit mysterious to us. Um, we think we know a lot about them. We assume they're made of ice. Um, we get to finally find out if that's the case or not. Hopefully, if they can at least stick that uh, uh, stick that drill in there. Are they mostly dust? Are they mostly ice? Are they mostly rock? What are they exactly? Um, you know, we've uh, we're, we're kind of uh, brought up on the stereotypical image of the the comet is moving closer to the sun and it's shooting off this stream of apparently water vapor that comes behind it. Turns out it's not exactly water vapor, and um, the what we're seeing there could be the result of it being water, or it could be uh, the result of I was reading today, you know, there's one theory that they're actually highly electrically charged rocks, you know, and that we're seeing ions coming uh, off these uh, off these comets, which would make them, <laughs> in some ways, a lot more interesting. Actually, it's like, well, how'd they get, you know, electric rocks? How'd that happen? Um, but uh, some of that's going to depend on whether they can ever drill into it, and the drill may not be usable on the uh, recharge uh, regimen that you that you just described. It may be, um, you know. We haven't we haven't heard the last on on what's going to happen yet. One of the things I was most interested in was uh, some of the kind of interesting ideas that were being thrown out there around. Well, we could move this and move this and see if we can't lodge it into a better position or maybe make it hop a little bit and get it get it out into the sun. It looks like they're probably not going to do any of those ideas, but I think it's uh, it's cool that uh, that that those options at least uh, are out there and. And, and can be explored. The risk you run, obviously, is that that doesn't work, and then your battery's dead. You throw it completely into shadow, and then you'll never recharge it again. You know, you lay it face down. I mean, there's, it's gone, you know, yeah, there's, yeah. There's there's yeah. there's so many there's so many potential downsides that you don't want to risk. That uh, half an hour a week sounds pretty good compared to like losing it completely. Um, so you know, they'll, they'll they'll probably go in the more the more reasonable direction. Now, one of the uh, criticisms I've read, or I, I, I don't know if I, I'd call it even a, a criticism, or a valid criticism, but I, I don't know. See what you think. W- w- one of the critiques, put it that way, that I've heard of this, is that you know the ESA made a big deal about how they weren't going to send any plutonium into space. Uh, this wasn't going to be nuclear powered. It was going to be purely solar powered. And right. y- you know, that, now that's kind of coming back to bite them. Um, gosh, wouldn't yeah, it backup it, nuclear generator have been a handy thing on on this. Oh yeah, you know the Voyager uh, spacecrafts, but one and two um, had plutonium or have plutonium batteries, and mm-hmm. uh, they these plutonium batteries, uh, you know, uh, will charge those uh, those spacecrafts uh, ninety years from the point that they were launched, and right. so twenty twenty five uh, for Voyager one, um, and. Um, you know that's that's the kind of uh, that's that's the kind of life you get out of a, a uh, out of a craft that has a nuclear battery like that. So that's um, wouldn't that have been great um, in hindsight? Well, it's not even in hindsight because I you know that they kind of weighed in on it, and there's you know the the whole issue is uh, well you know if we have what if we have a disaster on launch and we spread plutonium halfway across the EU, you know I mean. That's you know those those were their concerns, and yeah. those are valid concerns, and I understand that. Absolutely, but, yeah. I, I, I think uh, we can all agree it's not particularly dangerous to put plutonium into space, right? Yeah, space it's is kind of a radioactive, space. and you know, 
you know, once it's, it's a, in space, it's okay. Yeah, you're not you're not going to be polluting space with a uh, yeah. Uh, you know, a, space is with, like radioactive as all get out. I mean, it, it's as radioactive yeah. as you can get. It's, it's a dangerous place. Um, but uh, but yeah, you're right. The you know the potential is if it la- something goes bad on launch and then you got uh, then you got you know dealing with that nasty battery fallout or whatever on earth and and you want to avoid that well that's a that that is definitely a legitimate uh a legitimate concern it just calls for the space elevator all the more strongly i think um you know absolutely we so we can you know safely put those <laughs> plutonium batteries safely put that uh, uh, yeah and, and have and have plutonium batteries in uh in all our spacecraft uh without the the, the issue of you know potentially uh, exploding one uh, with a with a launch vehicle, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I I can understand why they didn't do it, but it sure would have been nice had uh, you know had had that uh, spacecraft arrived safely with a with a plutonium battery. So oh, oh well. yep. Oh well, you know the 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 other side of this is um, uh, one of our other stories tonight, which is um, in uh, in in light of this celebration, we can also note that. The 25th anniversary of the Hubble telescope has just passed, um, and it's like, wow. Well, 25 years is a pretty good run compared to 60 hours plus half an hour a week, or whatever we end up, uh, whatever we end up getting out of that. But that's not really the, uh, the the main comparison between the two that I want to make, because you know sometimes you just have bad luck. I mean, some we've sent probes to Mars, um, you know that did nothing, right? That disappeared, right? The, the, right. That, uh, that had no lifespan at all. Uh, the the first uh, Soviet uh, lander on Venus melted, right, after sending back like three seconds of video. I mean, so so it happens. I mean, sometimes you send stuff into space and you get a big, long shelf life out of it. Sometimes you get just a few seconds, you get just a glimpse, um, but it's almost always worth it. Um, but the, but the to me, the real comparison with Hubble is, do you remember – what happened with Hubble right after it was first launched? Yeah, quite well. Um, it was uh, <laughs> it, it needed a, it needed glasses. You know, it, yeah. everything was Hubble blurry. Didn't work. The, there was, the, a, the there was a problem were... with its mirrors. Uh, yeah, and uh, and so you know they were getting some science out of it, but it was it was a huge disappointment. And it was another one of those. Well, you know, uh, we spent all this money on it, and you know nothing. You know, nothing good's going to come of this. Well, it's uh, it, you know, it turns out that's not the case at all. They, uh, it, but it took <laughs> 30 hours in a uh, with the uh, a, a repair job with some real daring uh, spacewalk uh, to fix the thing, didn't it? And uh, one of the coolest, once, one of the coolest shuttle missions ever, I think. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. you know, you know, they they, they sent a crew up there. Really, just to do that. I, I mean, I assume they did other things while they were up there, but that was the uh, that was the thrust of that mission. Walk out there um, and do repairs on a satellite. I mean, it, it's a, it, it's it's one of the coolest uh, uh, shuttle missions ever. Uh, one of the greatest uh, opportunities for astronauts to to do some real life, you know, kind of technical stuff in space. And they fixed the Hubble. The Hubble turned into this incredible resource i mean look at any of these uh uh retrospectives on the hubble and just look at the pictures and we're used you know it's almost like we're kind of used to these amazing images from hubble telescope now that we've almost kind of gotten like well okay there's another you know picture with a (laughs) three light year long cloud in space or something like that you go oh yeah that's pretty that's, that's nice um and i and i think that maybe uh computer graphics have have dulled our senses to it a little bit but look back at look at those and think about the best picture we had of the universe before hubble and the picture yeah. we have of it now i mean the visual images that we have in our minds of what the universe is today because of because of hubble and and you know there's just no comparison it's it's one of the greatest well, triumphs i think in in the history of astronomy um hubble go ahead and start uh, you know the picture the picture uh, that uh, you know Bring home to me, and uh, I think some of the, you know, some of the images are, you know, like uh, the Magellan, um, uh, you know, galaxy and things like that. It's, uh, yep. Uh, it's just beautiful stuff. But the one, of the, one of the images that came back from the Hubble that just blows my mind every time is is the one that it just a deep, deep uh, view of the of the cosmos, 
and every little smudge is a galaxy. And I mean, yeah. it's, and it's, it's so, you know, just this huge image. And um, it's, it looks it's, like the uh, starriest night you ever saw. It looks like, you know, yes. a, 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 even a starrier night than you've ever seen. But you, you would say, oh, look at all the stars. And they're not stars. Every one of them is yeah. billions of stars. It's, uh, yeah. That, yeah. That one, uh, I it's get a chill. mind blowing. Just talking about that picture. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, yeah. One of the most astounding images ever. And, and all that's to say that uh, Hubble, glorious uh, accomplishment initially seemed like it was going to be a failure. Now, obviously, the fix that was put in place for Hubble is not is not an option for uh, Rosetta for any number of reasons. Uh, we're, we're, you know, they're, they're not going to fix it that way. But but it's just a reminder that you can't give up on something too easily. I think that uh, the, the the potential for great things to come from uh, from this current mission is still there, and uh, I think we'll see some I think we'll see some really cool stuff. Oh yeah, from Rosetta. <laughs> Um, as as we have from Hubble, and it just makes me uh, it, it makes me really look forward to things we're going to be seeing. Um, something about landing on that comet, uh, which was never done before this week, and uh, you know Europe is finally in the game in a big way, right? Uh, Russia, the first uh, satellite, uh, the first uh, man in space, U.S. Uh, first man on the moon, and now. You know, not bad, not bad. Europe first landing on a comet. I'm, uh, you know, I'm pretty. <laughs> I, I thought it was. I thought I, I kind of chuckled to myself when I uh, when I heard the uh, NASA spokesman's response. He says, "With this, we we take our first step into the solar system, or, or you know, into conquering the solar system, making it ours." I'm thinking, you know what? Uh, your organization did something pretty remarkable in 1969. So come on, yeah. this is not the first step, <laughs> but it's it's an important step. But it's not the first yeah. step. Come on. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you know, the moon, that's just sorry. part of the Earth system, right? It's not the solar system, I guess, is, is, is where he was going. But, yeah, I, I, I think I think Apollo gets plenty of credit, as does Sputnik and, uh, and your, your yeah. flight. You know, it, it's all good. <laughs> it's it's all exciting stuff. But it, but it makes me look forward to uh, what we're going to be seeing um, in, in terms of uh, future missions to uh, maybe not uh, – Maybe not comets, but to but to uh, asteroids, uh, to, to meteors. Um, you know the the asteroid mining that we've talked about uh, as a as a commercial possibility. Something about watching this made that seem more real to me. You know, it's like, well, I yeah. guess you really can yeah. land on one of these things. I don't. I know we've orbited an asteroid before. Have we ever actually landed on one? No. Uh, this is the first soft uh, soft landing of, of of a craft on something like this. Now we've, on, we've on anything that's not a planet, yeah. yeah that's right. We've bombarded um, a comet. Uh, it was either a comet or a large asteroid. Uh, a few years ago, we, uh, you know, we crashed something into uh, uh, a, uh, an asteroid, and just to watch the plume come up and, and to get, you know, do a, an analysis on the plume that, that came up right. and get, get some idea of what what it's made of. Um, but this is the first time they've ever attempted something like this, and so yeah, it's an amazing mission. Yeah, it's just a great, great week, um, a great, a great moment uh, when it occurred. It was fun seeing the uh, uh, the the uh, probe on uh, Google for like two or three days in a row. Google uh, outdid themselves on uh, you know repeating an image over a period of time. I, I I didn't recall ever seeing something for more than a day, and it's everybody was so excited about this that that uh, that kind of went on for a while. And uh, look, looking forward to seeing more developments with this. I think it's I think it's gonna be great. Well, we've got some other modern problems that we need to uh, to get to because we're on kind of a tight schedule this evening, Stephen. So we've got to, we, we, we've got to get to our other topics. Um, now, what about this? Uh, X Men style mind control becomes a reality. The, the the subheading here was man plays video game using the hand of another gamer, sat half a mile away. For one thing, I, I realized this was in the Telegraph, and uh, you know British English and American English are not the same, but I'm pretty sure that was a typo. Uh, I think they meant to say seated or something. Anyhow, uh, okay, so you got one guy um, looking at a video screen, and. Uh, a, a, another guy standing, uh, actually holding the control, and his hand is the one that's making things happen. The guy who's not actually looking at Correct. the game, uh, because uh, his hand is responding to what the person who's looking at the game is thinking. Basically, you've got here, um, 
you know, mind control is kind of a weird way of putting because you're not really controlling the person's mind. Uh, it's more like puppet mastery uh, of one no. person over another. Um, one, one person essentially using another person's body, at least their hand, um, as a, you know, as as a puppet, as a tool, basically. Um, and scale from one to ten, how creepy would you say this is, Stephen? It's um. I don't find it terribly creepy. Um, and, okay. And the reason I, the reason I don't is, uh, you know, I can't imagine someone using this technology to uh, to turn me into a puppet. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, this this involves a lot of uh, a lot of voluntary. <laughs> this is it's something that has to be voluntary, I, I presume, because uh, you know you have to you have to be you know have this thing strapped on your head and uh, everything. I mean, it's not like. Um, you know, you could, you could use a machine like this to take over just, you know, a random person or anything. Um, this and, and a lot of cool things about um, it's done without invasive surgery. They didn't have to implant electrodes deep into someone's brain. This was done with a, a skull cap that had um, that, that has, you know, the, the sensors uh, placed uh, around the uh, the motor control areas of the brain specifically and. Uh, uh, and on both the person sending out the uh, the the, the uh, message of how to move the hand, and uh, the, and then the person sitting there just with their hand on the joystick, uh, controlling uh, controlling the joystick that, that handles the game. And it's uh, so they they talked about you know some of the ways that this technology could be used were, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, imagine someone who's had a stroke, Phil, that. Um, you know they've lost the ability to move, and um, and you know it, you, often a person with uh, with you know some sort of a brain injury or a stroke injury like that, they're they're left. Uh, it, it it's difficult for their brain to rewire. Maybe the damage is right. too great to to allow a, a, an, an easy fix like this. But what if uh, what if you know someone with a healthy brain uh, were able to uh, move their arms and and and, and then slowly turn over that to the uh, to the healing brain of, of the patient, wouldn't that be an interesting therapy to allow someone to recover movement after a stroke? Um, I think that's that's remarkable. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I, I, I think uh, the, the potential here for rehabilitation, because when I first read the article, they, they mentioned that at the beginning. I'm going, I don't see how it would help, right? Um, <laughs> You know, because I'm thinking um, the whole idea behind, you know, recovering from an injury is you want your brain to be controlling it. But then as you read through it, you say, oh, I, I do understand um, that, the, uh, that, the, that the nature of the movement is you can get the body moving that way and then slowly involve the other person's brain in it, right? You, you, you right. get that muscle memory. You get that, uh, that tendency uh, for, the, uh, for the body to move that way. And um, it, it could be tremendously helpful to people who are uh, – who are trying to make recovery from that. The other thing that occurred to me is that uh, it could probably be used with healthy people for training, learning how to do difficult things, you know, things that are difficult to do. I mean, uh, yeah, the therapeutic thing is, is a great application, but how long would it take before, once this was available, somebody said, you know what, I want to get the right golf swing, and I'm ready to pay. Right, I'm <laughs> I'm ready to pay, to have somebody else give me the right golf swing, right? Because yeah. you, you know, practice, put, put Tiger, practicing put Tiger is all very well. Uh, you're, you're, under... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're going to get Tiger. He, he he'd be pricey, but uh, you know, even the even, 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 even the, the golf, golf pro club. at like your local club, you, you could get his swing, right? For sure, probably. <laughs> um, well, really, really make uh, those uh, those lessons <laughs> worthwhile, huh? Well, how, how about this? How about this is an idea, and this is not mentioned in the article. This is just me throwing this out. Um, uh, what if uh, a person who's a quadriplegic had one of these skull caps on, and then had his body wired so that he could, re you know, regain uh, use of uh, of maybe maybe just his arms in the case of a quadriplegic? Um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't that be a huge deal to a quadriplegic to have use of their arms again? Um, you know, um, through use, you know, through some sort of intervening technology like that, where you know the the brain is still, the the you know the brain's still doing its thing, uh, but right. you disconnect from the body. If if you could, you know, if you can connect one person to another, why couldn't you connect a brain to the body that's right there? 
Um, well, I think I know. you know, but I think there have there have been uh, there have been treatments along those lines. I I, I feel like what you're suggesting, I, I, I'm not sure, but it feels like that wouldn't work here just because, um, you know, the, the brain talking to the body seems to be the missing piece anyway, right? I mean. It, I, I could be missing exactly how this thing interfaces, but but if uh, if you're paralyzed and you you know if if you if, well I don't know if if you hook up the remote person to the paralyzed person does the does the remote does the paralyzed person's body now work I'm not sure that it would it seems to me that there would have to be additional work done there but I guess we're probably outside of our depth here in understanding the nature of uh, paralysis and probably the neuro the, the neurology behind uh, what's happening there. Um, but but what you're suggesting well, uh, is definitely sound. The, the the idea of you know somebody using their own brain to kind of hardwire their body back into working is that the idea? Yeah, yeah exactly. But uh, uh, something that is mentioned in the article, uh, another another cool technology or another cool way to use this would uh, be to allow surgeons to um, you know basically take over the arms of a lo- of a of a local doctor. From miles and miles away to, uh, to to help do surgery, um, you know, on somebody that is you know that hundreds of miles away. Now, you know they, they they've done telesurgery before, you know, where you have a robot there that you're controlling. Right. But um, you know, um, robots don't have the same dexterity as the human hand. So um, imagine you know doing this, you know, uh, allowing the world's best surgeon to practice worldwide by uh, a method like this. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I I think it's uh, it's very exciting. Uh the, the the potential for those kinds of applications are uh are, are really neat. Although I have to wonder, you know, if the world's best surgeon, right, was suddenly controlling my hands, right? It's got to be a really good interface for yeah. my hands to it would to need, have the it same would need to be yeah, it, it would need to be like uh, a perfect interface because right. the, the well, hand, you know, and he'd need a few minutes to adjust. It's like, why are my fingers so short or long, or why is my thumb so far out? You, you know what I mean? It's yeah, strange exactly. to be working with hands that, that aren't yours. Um, but 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 assuming you could overcome that, uh, yeah, it would be you know it'd be pretty cool. Or you think about you know just for fun, the world's greatest pianist tunes into you, and suddenly you're able to. Uh, <laughs> You, know, <laughs> you impress your guys. Pound out some you know, Rachmaninoff uh, or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's oh, great gosh, for parties, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> I did. Phil, I didn't know you played. Uh, yeah, well, just tonight. Yeah. <laughs> just for the next 23 minutes, actually. So if you got any requests, yeah, this is, as, long you know. as, as long as I got this guy on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now's the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's very cool technology. Uh, it's not. Again, I say it's not really mind control and and, and not creepy. Uh, it would be very hard uh, for this to be abused uh, the way it's de- the way it's described here. But it does seem to have a number of really uh, positive potential uh, applications, and uh, I'm sure we'll see more on this in the near future. Well, that that brings us, I guess, to our uh, third and final story. This one really got my attention. Uh, the story is the drug unlocks malleable, fast learning, childlike state in the adult brain. And this is the kind of uh, breakthrough that uh, that we need more of. You know, when you talk about life extension, uh, there's, there's always this discussion um, with people who aren't familiar with what you mean by it about the fact that you're talking about um, increasing health span. You're, you, know, you know, you're talking about increasing viable years in a person's life, not just uh, prolonging decrepitude, but in taking the vital part of a person's life and making that last longer. Well, one of the sad, unfortunate facts of life is as we get older, our brains uh, don't work the way they did when we were younger. Uh, and this this article that we've linked to here actually explains that pretty well. I mean, there's, there's good reasons for why uh, your brain has to kind of settle down after a while. When you're a kid, you're just sucking everything in, and your brain is, uh, you know, the, the they, they use the term plastic. They use the term malleable. Your brain is ready to receive data and just write it all down and, and, and take it in. Later, um, you need some stability in the brain, and, you know, that kind of kicks in. And then that stability process goes uh, goes too far, and, you know, a certain rigidity sets in, and eventually the, the brain just doesn't work nearly as well as it did. Well, what if we could get some of that 
plasticity back? What if we could get some of that ability to just take on new skills and to take on new knowledge back? Apparently, there is a way to make this happen, and it is through a protein expressed in brain cells known as PIRB. Um, in humans, it's called LILRB2, um, which stabilizes neural connections and makes it possible to put a brain back into this earlier state, this, this more uh, open to learning kind of state. And, you know, Stephen, when, when I look at this story, I say uh, there, there's, a, there's, a couple of, there's, there's a couple of really intriguing things about this. First off is how simple it is potentially to make this happen. And, and it just kind of reminds you um, of the fact that we, we don't know as much about how our brains work as we would like because we can still make, you know, these kinds of discoveries and it just suggests that there are huge discoveries yet, uh, uh, yet to be made. But that it's so simple. It's a molecule, right? You know, if you, can, if you can get this molecule working in your brain, suddenly an old brain can become very much like a young brain. Um, and it, and an older person could start functioning in many ways uh, the way the way they did when they were younger. Um, I, I think this is a, a tremendous potential for for this kind of thing, and I would expect to see a, a lot of interest in this. And, and and I would expect to see this going in a clinical direction probably in the very near future. What do you think? Absolutely, and it's uh, it's you know as our population ages, it's it's uh, it's a critical thing. Uh, that, uh, you know, we maintain our ability to learn things as we get older and, and uh, to not, you know, to, to not, uh, you know, just uh, basically have life be over, uh, you know, at, at, at age 60 or 70 or 80. Uh, we need to be able to uh, con- continually retrain and do new things and, uh, and, and, uh, and to find new purposes for, for things. I was, you know, when I when I read this article, I immediately thought to myself, you know what? It seems to me that this this process of uh, of, of brain aging is very different from person to person. You know, I, I, I you know, I've I've known people that seem set in their ways by age thirty, and then other far more interesting people, uh, well into their seventies and eighties. That, um, uh, you know, I have a neighbor neighbor down the street here who earned her doctorate at age eighty two. You know, um, right. wow. and just just a you know just a, a, a neat neat lady uh, who uh, you know you know there there were people who asked well why in the world well you know uh, because I was fascinated in this area of study and you know, right uh, I had things I wanted why to learn. Not? absolutely yeah. yeah and so it's uh, you know and it's not over till it's over so don't act like it is uh, and uh, you know just a real neat lady and there's um, and you know the uh, what was the uh, the singer that you posted uh, something about on Facebook uh, with Leonard, Leonard, Leonard Cohen? Um, Leonard oh. Cohen. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, just people like that, and you know, you can even think of uh, what Supreme Court justices that are still hand, handing down That's decisions right. in their nineties. You know, I mean, these guys stay active; they keep their brains uh, active, and it's not just. You know, it's uh, they found that it's not just meaningless exercises that allow people to main, maintain plasticity, and and you know, um, you know, the, these these little little games uh, that they have for, I don't know, these handheld video things that claim to do that. They don't. That doesn't work according to these right. the stu- this recent study. Unfortunately, that doesn't be, really help. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't really help. What helps is to have a purpose, something that fascinates you. That is right. all-consuming and that you throw yourself into. That is what uh, what keeps your brain young, because uh, it it can't be something meaningless that uh, it doesn't really engage engage you. It has to be something that's uh, uh, all-consuming. And uh, when it is, then you know you you, you maintain a and maintain a young mind. And uh, if we can get a little uh, pharmaceutical help with that, uh, that that's not a bad thing either. So yes. Uh, huge area for study, and uh, well, I think I, very, I think so too. I, you know, I, I think every little bit helps, right? Uh, yep. if, if there's uh, if there's behavioral things we can do, if there's lifestyle things we can do, we we need to be, you know, we need to be all over those things. Um, and yeah, find your, you know, find your passion, find your fascination, um, and keep your and, and keep your brain young. But but if there, you know, if there are clinical things that can be done, let's work on those as well. Uh, because I, I got to tell you, anything you can do for the brain. Anything you can do for the mind, 
um, around aging, I think, is is hugely important when we talk about this difference between maintaining a a healthy, you know, uh, extending health span versus just um, extending decrepitude. Because that's really the fear. I mean, here's the, you know, given the choice, right, uh, which would you rather have? Would you rather still have basic mobility but your mind mostly gone, right? Or would you rather have your body, you know, unfortunately pretty much not able to do too much, but the mind's still there, right? You know, well, ask, that's ask not even hard Austin. for me on. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's it, not a hard You know, one. the thing we don't want to lose is ourselves, right? And ourselves are in the, exactly. you know, that's in our mind and that's in our brain. And anything we can do to, to fortify that, I think, uh, is extremely important for for life extension because you know what the other stuff we're working on it anyway right the, the, you know keeping the body going there we're actually getting pretty good at that let's keep the mind going too um e- even in these kind of uh macro uh, you know old fashioned ways that that we have to rely on until the uh, until maybe some of the more elegant treatments show up I, although it might not be too long before we start seeing some of those but anything we can do to to keep uh to keep that together I think is uh, is going to be tremendously important. So I'm, I think I'm, I'm uh, encouraged the, by this story. I think I think sometimes the body keeps going because the mind is still there. Um, if that yeah. makes any sense. And, and 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 you know, thinking of Stephen Hawking, the man has ALS. Okay, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, is that is that correct? I mean, I'm not 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 saying the wrong disease. Lou Gehrig. Am I? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, and. As far as I know, he's like the longest lived person, you know, that it's ever, that that we're aware of with this disease. And I, I'm know, sure it, he must be, yeah, or one it, of them. Anyway. Yeah. That can't be a coincidence that you know one of the great geniuses of our time happens also to be the longest lived. You know, and it, you know we can't. It, we're not that lucky, okay? Right. Um, it right. has to be. There has to be some connection between his 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 beautiful mind. And and the and the ability of the body to keep on going. And uh, yeah, you're saying it's not I just correlation here. There's some causation here. That uh, there's some causation. That, that, there's some causation. Yeah. And uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think keeping your, keeping your mind uh, uh, healthy and active, um, I, I think, uh, leads to longevity. Um, and uh, you know, and and not just because uh, you have the reflexes to. Uh, uh, to avoid being in an accident or something, it, it, there's there is there is some causation there. I, I have to believe. I think you're right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, with that, Stephen, believe it or not, this is how long a 45 yeah, minute show lasts. Now we know. <laughs> that, 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 it turns out that lasts 45 know. minutes. Well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. It was longer than a half an hour, but it wasn't as long as an hour, I guess. It wasn't quite as long as a normal show. Um, I don't know. Our music tonight. It, our music tonight is uh, "Feel What I'm Feeling." By the band Special Guests. All right. Special Guests with Feel What I'm Feeling. Well, thank you, Stephen, for putting that together and also for coming up with all of our uh, topics this evening. Appreciate that. Thank you all for being with us. We'll be back with another brand new show again next week. I'm not saying how long it will be. And until next time, <laughs> live to see it.
At Les Schwab Tires, we're drivers just like you. We merge, we get stuck in traffic, we go on road trips, and we know what it means to truly rely on your car, which is why we do everything we can to make things right with you and your vehicle. From checking your brakes for free to patching up a flat when you need it. So if that sounds good to you, well, we're right there with you. Les Schwab Tires. Doing the right thing matters. Hey, I'm Paul. The guy who used to ask if you could hear me now on Verizon? Not anymore. I switched to Sprint. It's 2016 and every network is great. In fact, Sprint's reliability is now within 1% of Verizon's. Don't let a 1% difference cost you twice as much. Visit a Sprint store, sprint.com slash network, or call 800-SPRINT-1. Reliability claim based on third-party drive test average carrier features differ subject to $30 activation fee credit and valid for NC website for eligible plans. Limited time offer. Offer coverage not everywhere for all phones. Restrictions apply.